And welcome to uh, Virtual Bridge Television. Um, and uh, please note this session is being recorded. And please note we'd like your participation. Uh, hopefully you've found the chat pane and you can put in a, the odd comment and question in there. But we'll be opening mics as well after the presentation. Uh, today it's something that I'm very passionate about, accessibility. And particularly I think we're looking at um, accessibility by design. <coughs> Still in this age, if you've got a Win 10 machine, if you go down to the bottom left hand corner and, or on the keyboard, you'll see that it's a start button that's required to shut down your machine. Um, obviously, that's a legacy from quite a while back. Um, but we, we do, in fact, live with systems which are not ideal. My wife is a school secretary for many years, dealt with a system called Click and Go, which seemed to be Click and Go on a training course to work out how to use it rather than intuitive design. But what is sure that whatever we do in terms of accessibility inclusion will help us all. And with that, and I'll let Laura introduce herself from Fourth Valley College on making delivery online work for everyone. Very important at the moment. Over to Laura. Hi, okay, so good morning and hope you're all well. And as Jean said, thank you for the introduction. Um, and. Uh, I'm Laura. I work as the Assistive Technology Coordinator for Forth Valley College up here in what is actually sunny Scotland just now, which is typical because we can't go outside. So um, I'm going to share my screen now and I'm not sure that I'm going to say anything totally revolutionary. Hopefully it will all make sense to you and um, you'll see that um, accessibility is not so scary and um, an essential part and you're probably doing a lot of it already which is reassuring i think okay so i will share my screen and i will make sure i pick the right meeting well it's going to be the wrong one hang on that's because i did the um backdrop with my tie fighter so <laughs> and just get the right screen up. Okay, so. If you share the wrong one, we'll look away quickly. <laughs> oh, if only. Right, okay. Oh, no, that's still not the right one. Hang on, hang on. There we go. Okay, right, here we go. Right. Here we are. Hopefully. Points like these that you rue having 32 windows open. Yes, I shut a lot of my stuff down because it's just yeah, so slow. There we go. Can you all see that? Is that good? Okay, yes. lovely. Right. So I'm going to just start my presentation from the beginning. And hopefully this will run. I'm using a PowerPoint, PowerPoint online from Office 365 because hopefully when this starts, you'll We'll be able to see that I have my subtitling on, she says, as she switches it on. Okay, starting subtitles. Okay, so um, I've been assured that this is uh, nice and informal, so um, I'm just going to go into it. I've called this, it's all in the delivery. I use that sentence an awful lot when talking about accessibility. Um, I think sometimes you can do a, you can be given a really bad piece of information, but if you deliver it in a way that is um, palatable to people, you don't get so much of a horrible reaction. So um, in that vein, it's all in the delivery. Let's make our accessible sessions online good for everybody and an experience that is positive for everyone, including the person presenting, because we're all in this and we've kind of been forced into this presenting online um probably a lot quicker and um than we would have wanted to a lot of us would have possibly been dabbling in this and rolling out online learning something like that but now we're we're having to do it so it's a bit stressful for everybody so um let's just remember that and uh, give ourselves a bit of a break so i'm going to make a big assumption here and i'm going to assume that we're all not here to talk about why we need to do accessibility because um as you can see i've put really it's why are we not being accessible um you know we i've put there a few things it's obviously the right thing to do we want everybody that comes to our online um sessions or our in-person sessions when we can um 
to enjoy the experience, to take something away from it, to learn from it, um, to feel that it's been worthwhile for them for a time perspective. I mean, that is one of the most valuable things, your time. And so nobody wants to feel like they've wasted it. And if you pitch up for something online and you're halfway through and you can't access it, it's not in a, a format that you can, um, can get on board with then you feel like you've just wasted your time and that's not how anyone wants you to feel when you come to one of these things also accessibility is not as complicated and time consuming as you would think so we have put or i have put um the subtitling on there that's a couple of clicks and make sure that you're using the right format a powerpoint on the desktop doesn't do it but powerpoint in office 365 does so there we go. Anyone who's struggling with audio or has um, hearing impairments can keep up with my lovely chat and yeah, or has a heating impairment as my um, subtitle is saying. It's not always perfect, you have to admit. Um, okay, so also it's the law and this is the legal bit. So um, the Equality Act in 2010 um, shows us that we're encouraged and by law to ensure that everybody can access um, every day, um, every day of life things, services. Um, so we are in a very fortunate position that our country and our government assumes that education is one of these things that is an everyday must. So with that, we have the um, social model of disability. And as you can see, the quote there is, um, we go with the social model because it views the environment that the person is in over the, what the, over the disability that the person has. So it's more about us changing the environment and um, making sure that everybody is included rather than trying to sort the disability or the person in order to make them fit our environment. And then when it comes to being online, we've got the public sector bodies, websites and mobile applications, accessibility regulations. There's a mouthful for you. So those came in in August, in, sorry, September 2018. And um, that covers websites, um, but it also covers your content. So any digital assets. So if you are presenting online or you are handing out resources, which we are now all doing, sharing digital resources. Um, it is up to um, us as public sector bodies to be providing those in accessible formats. That doesn't mean that you have to provide them in every single format from production, but you need to be able to produce those if you're asked to and have a variety of formats available in the outset. So with saying that, we'll move on to a bit of a disclaimer. My disclaimer is that technology is not a magic fix. So um, you're not going to find an app or a piece of software that will magically remove people's barriers for them. Some people are not digitally literate. That's including the people presenting sometimes. Um, we are not, as I said at the beginning, we're not all... Um, completely experts in this um, a lot of us a lot of lecturers a lot of teachers are doing this for the very first time and you know we need to be conscious of that we need to be conscious that the presenters and the people we're presenting to are are new to this a lot of them will be new to this um, and it's important that we also realize that not everyone will have access to devices. So um, again, a bit of a disclaimer, it's a case of we're not here to talk about the fact that if everybody's to access it, not everyone has a device. I totally appreciate that. Um, and you know, also the current pandemic means that we are not doing this in a fashion that we would have um, chose to do. We would have perhaps chose to have a lot more practice sessions and to build up to being presenters online for classes or for um, conferences, etc. But we've all kind of been thrown into this and um, we're all doing our best. 
I think that it's important that I read a, an article not long ago, which well, kind of at the beginning of this, that said um, this is one of the best times to go in and make mistakes. So because everybody's new at it, everybody's drying this together. So, um, you know, make your mistakes in presenting online, have your kids walk in and the cat cross the computer. These are all things that, you know, it's, it's acceptable just now because, you know, nobody's got this down pat. Everybody is trying and everybody is, um, as I said, doing their best. So with that, we'll move into the content. So for making your presentations on, online more accessible for all your possible participants, um, a lot of it is preparation. So you are looking at, um, depending on what session you're running, um, having that dialogue with your participants. So for an open session like this, it's really difficult to um, have a one-to-one -one conversation with everybody that's going to turn up um, in order to ask them what their needs are and if they require anything specific to help them access the, um, the learning or the content that um, you're producing. So, um, but it is that you are responsible for proactively inviting people with accessibility needs to contact you to say that in the outset before you need to um, before you present. So, um, you know, just letting people know that they are, that they can contact you and say, actually, I need a interpreter or I need um, the handouts to be in size 24 point font. It's, um, as long as there's that kind of open dialogue, then you're, um, you're kind of, you're covered and you can prepare as best you can. If you've got known students, if you're taking a class um, or you have a meeting, then it's absolutely acceptable to ask those questions to say, you know, how can I best provide the information I'm sharing with you? Um, it's not demanding disclosure of needs. It's more encouraging um, everyone to to say, well, you know, if, if you get information in a way particular to you, then please tell me and I'll provide that for you. Um, it's about having that discussion with your students or um, people that you're presenting to and, and just asking them, you know, is there anything that you could do to benefit them? Because that will also take a bit of the stress off you because you'll have prepared for that and you might not be asked on the spot for something and not have it. So um, it's about kind of um, alleviating stress for yourself and alleviating stress for others. And in saying that, we're moving on to practice. So we've heard a lot of stuff about Zoom and Zoom bombing um, and things like that and the privacy. Some people will be very anxious about that. They won't have gone and logged into Zoom before. And then, of course, they're hearing all these rumours. It's, it's about trying to reassure people that you, you have security measures in place, that their privacy is, is considered, um, giving as much information about how you will run the session in advance. Um, I don't kind of need to point out, I think that, you know, for those with dyslexia or autism, having information in advance um, relieves anxiety. It means that they can, especially if they have memory or processing issues, they can read up on what they have to so that they feel as up to speed with those of us that may be reading the information and taking it in a lot quicker. Um, there might be people who have um, concerns about their set, their setup, their Wi-Fi. Could you give them any um, advice on that? And then, of course, I've put in the fear, those technical issues. So when you, I don't think I've ever been presenting online or actually in face to face and not had some sort of technical issue happen and um, that's just that's just the nature of technology and I think that um, the more you accept that and roll with it make a joke about it etc that will put everybody at ease and yourself and um, it's it's we've all seen it happen it's probably happened to all of us and you know just as I said, this, this is the best time to be making these kind of mistakes. Not that technical issues are necessarily mistakes, but, you know, nobody is expecting perfection. So um, try not to get anxious yourself about presenting online. A lot of people don't like cameras, things like that. So you just 
work with how you and your students or participants all feel comfortable. So moving on. Okay. So hosting your session. Oh, I've jumped ahead. Hang on. I told you my computer was slow. There we go. Okay, so uh, setting expectations. Um, this is about, you know, if you have a lot of students who jump on to a meeting, it's about maybe explaining to them that there are rules. Um, there are some ground rules that you might set up, like um, raising your hand for a question, um, that you will be putting everybody's mic on mute um, as they come into the meeting that um, if they want to participate, then if, reminding them almost that they will have a digital footprint. So if they put nonsense in the chat pane or they um, you know, say, make silly noises over the mic, that everybody that's in the room will be able to, to see that, to see that it came from them, including the teachers or um, or the other participants. So they are accountable and responsible for their actions. So it's about setting those in place. And once those are in place um, and the novelty kind of wears off, then you can kind of get down to actually having your, um, your session um, without so many interruptions. Um, just having um, some other etiquette, like muting your mic if you're not speaking. I've been on some sessions where you can't hear the presenter for somebody else's background noise. They've got the radio on or they're quite a heavy breather. None of those things are, you know, punishable, but then they can disrupt it for other people. Um, you know, being aware if you're collaborating online and um, just having some ground rules that, you know, maybe the speaker um, introduces someone to know so that they know that they can start writing on the whiteboard or whatever um, it is that you're doing and depending on what you're talking about possibly having um, some guidance on the language that you're using what is going to be acceptable and um, what's not acceptable um, in terms of the language that's being used um, that again depends on what your content is um, Next, it's looking at in respect, you know, not everybody will want to use their mic, not everybody will want to um, use the video. Um, and it's respecting those um, choices, those personal preferences. Um, we're going to have to, in many ways, reassess how we look at participation. And um, participation in the classroom was very much a um, thing where if you're vocal, if you put your hand up, if you're seen to be entering into debate with somebody, um, that was active participation. That's going to change online because you can't all talk at once and you some people might not be comfortable at um, talking on, on the mic. So it's about looking at how we view participation online, how we have... Um, the chat pane, how we use it, how there are um, discussion threads. Um, when the groups separate and go into rooms, um, using those different um, modes of communication, it's important for everybody, um, regardless of they, if they have a disability or not, to have different modes of communication that they can use to interact with your content. So, um, as I said, maybe they're going to prefer to to type in the chat pane maybe they're going to be happy to speak maybe they'll want to have the video and be happy to chat i very much use my hands i'm very much aware that if anyone can if anyone could see me just now i'm chatting away with my hands um so sometimes um that's all missed if you're online and you can only see a slide um so it, it's about being conscious that we're having to um all gauge each other slightly differently. Also, if you're doing a session and you've, you've only got a certain amount of time or you're going to have workshops, it's about having little breaks so that any written work that you've given out, the, the people that have, um, that need a little bit more time just to absorb that information, that they can they can have that, you know, having your, that, and that was part of saying, um, giving your information out 
um, as resources in the beginning, if they've already had a chance to read that, they will, they will feel up to speed. Um, resources, as I said, I could give a whole other session on resources. Um, I said earlier on that the um, web um, guidelines for accessibility, the regulations state that it covers all your resources, all your digital assets. So anything, Word documents, PDFs, anything that's online, accessibly, um, accessible to the public online or to your class or your staff is deemed a digital asset and therefore should be accessible. So that might seem like a, a massive task or a massive learning curve, but actually it's just about being a bit more considerate. If you were going to send out a, a mass email, one of the key things you would do once you'd written that email would be to um, spell check it. So really part of that step before you send it out should be to check it for accessibility as well. Have you used structure so that you're breaking up the content and making it more readable for people? Have you used colors that um, you've checked the contrast to make sure that they're readable for people who may or may not have um, impairment or um, dyslexia? Have you put alt text for anyone that might be reading um, your content with a screen reader? Have you put clear hyperlinks? Have you used plain English? If there's a structure, a table, has it got structure and can it, is it clear what your information is? These are all things that all of us benefit from, not just anyone with a specific learning difficulty. So there's lots of guidance out there on how to make the actual content that you're giving out to people accessible. But as I said, I could talk for hours on that. So. Um, and I don't have hours, I've only got a few minutes. <laughs> okay, so moving on. Subtitles and closed captions. Subtitles are obviously what's going along the bottom of the screen. Um, at the moment, um, I'm using the Office 365 um, PowerPoint. And, um, but if you're wanting an actual transcription that you can edit, then Otter AI is a really good transcription app. Um, that once you've recorded something, you can then take that and um, edit it, make sure that it's understood you. It also puts punctuation in, which a lot of the other, um, you know, Google typing, voice typing and um, Microsoft dictation, um, they, they don't have the punctuation. So um, Otter AI is something that I would recommend. Um, if you're putting up videos, um, then Microsoft Stream, they will do a transcription and you can then edit that. And YouTube also does closed captions. Um, so you, again, they'll automate it once you put the video, upload it, and then you can edit it to make sure that it's understood your accent. Um, if you've got documents you're giving out, um, it would be um, considerate of you to offer text-to-speech. Um, if somebody requires um, their learning, in a different format to just written text, if they prefer to hear it, then you can create an MP3 file of any of your documents. Read and Write have tech, uh, text help from Read and Write is really good. They, uh, that's free to teachers. Um, Claro Read is another um, software product that you can use. Both of those um, at the moment, they're offering them free to students for the length of um, the pandemic so um, you could offer them out for people to sign up and use that but Word has immersive reader which is fantastic and so if they're using Word online they will be able to um, download the document that you've offered and then augment it so that they can um, have it read to them and again that's partly why we've said why I've said earlier about giving people that little bit of time to absorb the information because they might need to do something to it if you haven't offered it in another format um, before they can digest it. And then if you're putting interactive material into your presentation, polls, quizzes, forums and things like that, it's just about making sure that um, for those that might not be able to access that, if there is always an alternative. So if there's going to be a poll but somebody can't access it, let them know that they could just put their answer in the um, chat pane um, just to you so they don't have to voice their um, their opinion or their choice in the poll to everybody 
Um, if there's quizzes, you could have that as a Word document that they could then type answers to and send back. It's just about having that consideration that the format that you're using should not be the only one that that comes in. And then little tips like if you're doing a demonstration on screen, go into your settings and make your cursor bigger and highlight it so that when people are following your cursor on the screen, it's easier to see because they have no idea where it's going and they're they've no preconception of where it's going to end up. So um, if you make it easier to follow, then that will help everybody gauge exactly what's happening on your screen as you show it. Uh, so post session, again, if you're going to be sending things out, it's about having as many formats um, available as possible. So um, recordings of the session, um, if there's been a lot of chat in the chat pane, then, you know, the transcription of the chat pane out, there might be links in there that people have posted. Um, if you're giving out links to people, make sure they're clear links. A lot of time there's a lot of click here and that's not any use for someone that's using um, a screen reader. So make sure you have the documents named um, in the link or the resources, sorry. Um, and then if you're asking for work back, then again, can it be submitted in different forms? So it might not be possible for everybody to um, download and send, retype a Word document. Could they absorb your information and then have a professional discussion with you? Could they video record their answers and send that back to you? If students are given presentations, um, rather than have them deal with the presenting online, could they um, record their presentation and put it up and then have a discussion thread from that where other students could comment and you could just ask that students watch each presentation and make a comment on it. So um, there, is there different ways of doing things that um, would account for some technology and obviously if there's going to be diff different technologies being used then you know give people a little bit of time to get to grips with them and some support and advice. So I've put some links into this and I'll obviously share these slides with you after. Um, Autistica have done quite a nice um, blog post about making your online events accessible for people with autism. Just little changes like sometimes there is the need to clap for something that can be a bit overwhelming for people with autism. So there's like a, I think it's called a flapause. So everybody just waves their hands um, instead of physically making the sound of clapping. Um, sculpt um, by Worcestershire County Council. Those are materials to help make your resources um, accessible. They're fantastic and they're open source so um, you can go to the link and use those to um, keep yourself right and, and implement them in your institutions if you wish. Um, AbilityNet, they are fantastic. They have loads of resources about um, being online with a disability. Um, and how you can access things and set things up for yourself at home and so all the, and also how you can support someone who has a disability in engaging with you online. Um, then you've got your Microsoft Accessibility Checker. Vision Australia also have a document um, accessibility toolbar which you can download and add into Word and it's actually really good. You, it goes through all the different steps that you can to um, ensure that you've covered all the bases when producing a document. And then there's also information on government digital services about the uh, guidelines and there's links to the guidance and um, things that you can do to ensure that you and your materials are compliant with the regulations. And that is me. So if you would like to open up the chat um, and anything you want a little bit more information on um, I'll be happy to, to talk with you. Thank you very much Laura and that's uh, one thing that I'll be doing is using Office 365 Microsoft uh, PowerPoint presenter um, in order to get subtitling so mm. uh, one change you've already uh, won me over. Okay. Um, if anyone would like to open their mic or put something at the chat pane then please do so. Hi there, how can we get access to the PowerPoint, like once we come offline? 
Um, I will I will forward it to Kenji, and Kenji can um, he has a list of everyone that will be on the um, the chat today, so um, it can be shared out. With Thanks, I'll be oh, visiting the virtual bridge page indeed, and I'll be put up there the uh, the recording on YouTube. Um, and also the materials, like the PowerPoint presentation through that right, that's great. hub page. Thank you. No Any other comments or reflections or questions? Don't be shy. Oh, Kenji, there's... Silence to all. <laughs> uh, uh, so, Laura, um, we, we have a, a training session with Kelly Moat, um, mm -hmm. who's doing a workshop session around the, the new regulations that have come into force for public sector bodies and they yeah. are pretty harsh yeah. in the sense that we we heard i think in february that it definitely extends to vle's things behind firewalls yep. all digital content like you said the pdfs the slides that are attached yep. also there was a question raised i can't remember if it was from me but in <laughs> in, in the sense of when you're talking about digital content that is accessed to a wide student body does it include things like um, email? Um, and if it does, what can you do to make email more accessible? Is there anything particular? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. um, I'm not sure if it covers email. I really, actually, I don't know. That's a very good question. Um, I guess it would depend on if how much information you're passing over in that email. Is it a very short email or is it like almost full-length document any document that you would send attached to that email if it's a document that's going out to the public and um, you know if it's just between friends then no but if it was um, a formal email from for example fourth valley college to a student then yes it the, that document that is attached with it should be compliant um however if you're sending an email there are, i don't have i can't remember the website but there are various um mp3 things that will turn your email the text in your email into a little uh, audio recording so you can embed that in the bottom of your email and um, therefore the person um can choose to listen to have to the email read out it's not read out by you it's uh, read out by the computer but um we've used that in the past if we have students who really struggle with dyslexia sending them a big email with lots of instructions they're going to struggle to oh that's my cat um, they're going to struggle to um to absorb that information so having it in an audio format um, allows them to to get the same information in a way that they can access better for them um, rather than either having to get somebody else to read the email or augment it themselves because some of them won't have software some students actually won't even realize that that listening and to things in audio is their preferred way of absorbing information they just know that they really struggle to read so they might just find that having that audio is that's what they will choose from then on and regardless of having formally been diagnosed with having a learning difficulty so it's it's really all about being considerate i think and and just thinking that not everybody accesses information the same way that it's put out so if you can kind of put the, those uh, that information out in a couple of different formats you're going to cover a uh, tick a lot of boxes so to speak not that it's a tick box exercise but um you can you can make it a lot easier for people i think it was ability net um i saw abby james um giving a talk um down in london and she was saying that they, they have figures that is something like um those with a disability can sometimes spend up to 16 hours in a working week just trying to access things just trying to get into the information and make it in a format that they can absorb so i don't think anybody in any walk of life has 16 hours extra in their week to try and get information everybody knows how frustrating it is when you go onto a website and you can't get what you it says you've got an error in the page and you have to scroll all the way back up the page to find out where that error was in the form that you filled out those little things if you add all that up for those that have a disability then you know 
they don't have all that time to do that. So it's about making it a bit easier for them. And yes, those tools are out there for students or um, you know, the, the general public to use to augment things themselves, but they're not always going to know that that's the um, that that's what they need. And as I said um, on the top of my slide, uh, McDonald's do more than one kind of burger. So it's about if you go into a restaurant or you, you're not all expected to eat exactly the same dish in exactly the same way. There are choices that they make for you. They don't say to you, you can have a burger and a slice of cheese, but you'll have to put the cheese on the burger yourself. It's about offering it to people because the more you offer, the more people will come for your resources. And um, it's in this day and age, it, it's about personalised things. Everybody wants it personalised to them. And that includes education. So, you know, people are not going to come to your classes and not going to come to your um, institution if it's an absolute battle to get the information in a format that they need. So um, the more you can do to facilitate that, the more people and um, that you will benefit and that's just a good thing all the time. So thank you very much. And on that note, um, then and uh, and yes, taking forward the discussion further, then um, I will draw the formal um, part to a close. And so it's a huge thanks to Laura. There's a discussion here uh, to be taken forward and up, and uh, hopefully making Scotland and Northern Ireland um, key leaders or keeping them key leaders in uh, the accessibility of education. So thank you once again for Laura, Laura and uh, and uh, stay safe and sane. Thank you. Bye. Bye.